again, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. If you are saving a seat for someone, we ask that at this time, we have a line of people out the door that would love to be seated in this room. If we could have everyone go towards the center and open up all the aisle seating on the outside aisles. We have the ability to put a few more folks in here. Um, the fire marshal doesn't allow us to have people standing. So we're going to ask you to all come towards the center and open up the ends of every aisle. If there's some room in that aisle, please put it at the end so we can put more folks there.
Well, I have to readily admit that I am sorry that all of us are here today. I would have much rather been anywhere else. But because of the reason that we are here, I'm glad you showed up because it means an awful lot to those sitting right here on the front row. Those of you who are family, and even if you're not blood related, but you've been like family because you have been raised together, you've grown up together, I'm glad you all are sitting together because you have a common love and a host of memories and a lot of time you spent together and you make a difference for each other on days like today. Um, let me pause and just make one other comment. My connection to this family goes way back before Mike and Vince ever got married. And uh, I had the privilege of marrying the two of them and watching this family grow and develop over the years. For the vast majority of you who are friends, you're either friends of Donovan's or you're friends of part of his family, members of his family, I'm glad you showed up today because you make a difference for those sitting in these first couple of rows. I'm a pastor, you're in a church, so you have to know I have a bias, and that is I'm glad that God is here as well. He shows up at every one of these services, whether he's invited or not, whether he's acknowledged or not. And uh, though I've been doing this for close to 50 years, um, I've learned the fact that he shows up at moments like this in ways I never imagined in the last two years. COVID changed everything for a lot of us. And for services like this, we were told we couldn't have them. Funeral homes were closed down, cemeteries were closed up, and yet families wanted to get together some way. So we did them in living rooms, in backyards. I've done some on the riverbank and some at the ocean side. Believe it or not, in 2020, I did two in a bar. <laughs> I was not trained for that at Bible college, all right? There wasn't memorial services in a bar 101 class. Um, talk about the mixing of spirits on those two occasions, uh, <laughs> most, most unique. Uh, I will tell you there was a lot of Southern comfort that was available at... Uh, yeah. Some crowds I say that and they go, huh? But you, you guys picked up on that one, yeah. Um, but you know what? He wasn't intimidated to be there either. And he's not intimidated to be here today. And the reason he shows up is because he made a promise about 4,500 years ago. In the Old Testament, God says this, I am the God of all comfort. And in that one very short statement, he tells us two things. He tells us one Things like this happen in this world. This world is a crappy place to live, and it's got a lot of trouble. Sometimes other people cause us trouble. Sometimes we cause our own trouble. But we live in a world filled with trouble. And when you need comfort, God says, I will show up. You can ignore me, or you can invite me in. But he is here. One of the songs that's going to be sung today, I am confident it was not Donovan's favorite song. This is Vince's <clears throat> favorite song because it was his grandmother's favorite song. And Vince and I share something in common because this was one of my grandmother's favorite songs. <coughs> it is an old hymn of the church, but it illustrates the fact that God shows up at moments just like this. Bob Berthold, accompanied by Randy Berger, is going to come and sing for us in the garden. Tarry there, none other 
has ever I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go through his voice of war tells me that I am his own and the joy that we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound hush the singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and it talks with me and it tells me that I am his own and the joy that we share as we there, none other Sometimes people don't know if it's appropriate to applaud in a memorial service, but I kind of think it is. I've often said over these last several years when I grow up, I want to be able to sing like Bob. Um, absolutely incredible. Yeah, you've heard me sing, haven't you? So, yeah. Today we're going to be highlighting Donovan's good qualities, but at the same time, we're not going to ignore the fact that he had some challenges. I recently came across an article where a British pastor from the early 1900s was quoted. His name was F.B. Meyer, and he had this to say about judging others. Meyer pointed out that when we see a brother, a sister, a friend in a struggle, there are two things that we do not know. First, we don't know how hard he or she tried not to fail. And number two, we don't know the strength of the force that attacked him or her. And I would add a third. We don't know what we would have done in exactly the same set of circumstances. So my challenge to all of us today is this. Let's spend a lot more of our effort today loving each other and less time judging each other. There's a possibility, there is a good possibility that today may affect for good and for growth that will happen out of Donovan's story today than it will out of all of our lives put together. There's a possibility that no other circumstance will contribute to the beginning or the continuing of your spiritual transformation than this one mo moment in time as we spend it together. In the culture we live in, I never know how much 
Bible stories people know, so sometimes it's a gamble when I talk about somebody, but do most of you know the character of Samson in the Bible? Okay, um, a lot of heads going this way. If you don't know him, um, um, he was the Thor, all right, of the Bible. It's the best way I could describe Samson. The guy was incredibly strong and uh, had unusual talents, and God, God used him. But Samson was stubborn and strong-willed, and there were times that in spite of what God told him to do, Samson did his own thing. It ended up being somewhat devastating for Samson in the end, and yet the story of Samson has lasted for over 5,000 years, and people still talk about him today, and God still uses him to change lives. You see, Samson had long hair. He was a lady killer. He was a smooth talker. He had an athletic bod, not like this one. <laughs> <laughs> he probably would have played water polo, all right, had it been in the current time period. I am confident he would have driven a Corvette ZR1 if Samson lived in the 21st century. But Samson was God's man who got careless in his own personal life. Ever sound like you? Sometimes a little careless? What the Bible says of Samson could also be true of Donovan today. And here's what the Bible said about Samson after his death. He was more victorious in his death than he was in all of his life. And so the question for us is, are we going to waste this day and Donovan's impact on us, or will we pay close attention? And it could be said about him that his life and this day changed the course of others' eternal destiny. Coming today is not easy. Many of you know that today was supposed to be a different kind of graduation party, a celebration of a different kind, but your presence is deeply appreciated by Mike and Vince. I've set the bar pretty high for what I hope to accomplish today. In fact, the bar is set so high that I probably fear failure today more than any other time in my life. It was 44 years ago when I was only 24 years old when I preached my very first funeral. And it was the funeral of my 36-year-old uncle who died struggling with pancreatic cancer, and I was in the room with him. And on that day, I vowed to make his Memorial Day something special, and we didn't call them celebrations of life in those days, but for some reason, I did. I got in trouble. Preachers scolded me. This is, this is serious stuff. But my uncle had such a wonderful impact on my life. I wanted to celebrate his living, not his dying. And today... I don't want us to focus on the fact that Donovan is absent from us. I want to focus on the time that he spent with us. I want to celebrate those 18 years, and I want to remember the good moments as well as some of the tough ones. I want to remember 18 years of good memories, not his last moment. Let me explain my dreams for today. I hope that over the next few minutes we will laugh a little while we shed some tears because the Bible says that laughter is good medicine for the soul. I also want us to think a little bit about while we're hurting, why we're hurting. You see, we learn from our pain, and I want the best outcome for all of us. I want us to choose right when we walk away from here because it's so easy to choose to go do something wrong to numb the frustration. I want us to embrace hope when cuddling our despair and our pain would be a whole lot easier. I want to honor the good in Donovan's life, and I want us to learn from his hurt. I want to love and comfort these who are sitting right here on the front row. I want this to, beginning, to be the beginning of a fresh start and not the next step of something spiraling out of control. I want friends and community. I want you to waken up to the realities of behaviors that are destructive and the choices that we make that can be so, so hopeless. I want selfishness abolished and forgiveness acknowledged, and I want the grace of God accepted. I want encouragement and hope to rule this day. Am I expecting too much? Do you see why I'm afraid to fail? Let me see if I can set quick perspective, and then we'll get to Donovan. There was a mother who told her son one time not to go swimming. Don't know if you ever told Donovan that. This is not the day to swim. <laughs> it was the opposite. When he came into his house, he noticed, uh, the mom noticed that his hair was wet and his bathing suit was wet. And she said, Johnny, I told you not to go swimming. I couldn't help it, mom, he defended. The water looks so good. But why did you take your bathing suit with you? In case I was tempted. 
What do we do when we face the challenges of our life? Do we go prepared to give in to the temptations that are destructive to us? Or rather, do we listen to the wise advice of a mom? There was a four-year-old caught by his mom standing on a chair eating cookies in the kitchen. He had been told not to have cookies until after dinner. But he tried to explain the situation to his mom. He said, Mom, it's not my fault. I just climbed up to smell them, and my tooth caught one. <laughs> well, in a little while, all of us can let our tooth catch on a cookie uh, and some cupcakes and some pumpkin pie, because there's a lot of that over in the other building. And those of you over in the barn already, no head start yet. All right? You wait for us to come over and join you. Well, we have a story to tell today, and it's Donovan's story. And maybe as we think through his, it'll have an impact on us and we'll write a new paragraph to our own. Let's get to how things got started. He was born 18 years ago in Clovis Community Hospital on May the 20th, 2004. Micah, do you remember what day of the week it was? Well, that's all right, you were in a lot of pain. It was a Thursday, but that's all right, that's okay. It, it ended with a Y, so you were close, okay? And uh, at the time, the perspective of life at the time that Donovan was born is George W. Bush was president. If you voted for him, good. If you didn't, yeah, not so good. Uh, this was three years after, 20, uh, after 9-1-1, all right? And so we were still recovering from all of that. There were some great movies out the year that Donovan was born. Most of them sequels, okay? But great movies. Shrek, Shrek 2 was out, all right, with Murphy and Diaz. Spider-Man Two was out with Toby Maguire. Born Supremacy, number two in the Born series, was out that year. Kill Bill Two was out that year with Irma Thurman. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Now, slight break. It's number two out of that book, but it's number three in the series. All right, we were on a roll there. Hey, there's a couple of classic for you chick flicks out there. All right, The Notebook came out that year. Yeah, you all have cried through that one, haven't you guys? I have three times. And then also uh, Eastwood had Million Dollar Baby and Disney had Polar Express. What a year to be born. There were some hit songs. I can't tell you if these are any good or not because folks, I got to tell you, I'm too old for this list of songs. I'm looking through the top hits of, of 20, uh, 2004 and I didn't know but one of them. Number one that year was a song by, uh, two songs actually, by Usher, called Yeah and Burn. <laughs> Should I not be mentioning those in church? I, I have no idea. I didn't even look them up. Alicia Keys, that is a name I recognize, had a song out, If I Ain't Got You. Outcast and Sleepy Brown teamed up together, and I have no idea who the one of them are. The Way You Move. I won't let my imagination get carried away on that one. Winans, Inya, and P. Diddy. They had a song together called I Don't Want to Know, and I don't think I want to know either. And then Twista, Kanye, and okay, here's the name I know, Jamie Foxx. They did slow jams. So those were the hit songs the year your baby boy was born. He shared his birthday with some rather famous people. Again, you got to be my age or older to recognize the first one, but Jimmy Stewart, the actor, had his birthday. He was born in 1908. Another actor, a little more contemporary, and, and Shelley and I watched him in a series on Netflix not long ago, Timothy Oliphant had his birthday, born in 1968. Tony Stewart, the race car driver, shared this birthday. And, uh, okay, here's one that maybe for, for those of you who are Donovan's uh, age, um, Busta Rhymes. Is that your ass? Yeah, I, all right, sorry guys. I just saw he was a rapper. But anyway, they all shared the same birthday. Donovan's parents, as most of you know, are Vince and Micah. Donovan was born half grown, all right? He weighed 10 pounds when he showed up in this world. He was a big boy. He shared his parents with one sister and two brothers, and Donovan was the youngest of the bunch. Taylor, and I know she's in here. Where are you, Taylor? There you are, all right. The flowers are blocking your beauty from me, all right? So uh, Taylor is, can I share your age? She's 28, and she resides in Clovis, and she blessed Donovan with his only nephew, Jude, who was four years old. Gio, also sitting up here on the front row, got a lot more facial hair than the last time I saw him. 
He is 22 and residing in Clovis, and Elijah, the uh, added member of the family several years ago, and all that kind of started also right here. We shared a very special, difficult day together. Elijah's 21, and uh, he works at Prime 13, just in case you want to go check him out. Um, and he's the adopted brother since 2015, also residing in Clovis. He is survived by five grandparents, Papa Mike Molinari and Monty live in Tampa, Florida. Inga Molinari resides here in Fresno. Danita Gementi lives in Fresno, and Rich Ramirez also resides in Fresno. Donovan grew up in Clovis and attended uh, Century Elementary School. Anybody in the room who went to Century Elementary with Donovan? Raise your hand. All right, I got a hand back there, got a hand right here, hand over there. All right, way to go, way to go. Uh, and he also went to Alta Sierra Middle School. How many of you went to Alta Sierra? Raise your hands. All right, that's some, kind of some of the same group and a few more. All right, and he also went to Buchanan High School. Raise your hand if you went to Buchanan. Uh, okay, and a few more there. Terrific. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, while he was in high school and junior high as well, he participated in water sports, water polo and swimming. I understand he competed in freestyle and breaststroke. He um, just finished his high school education in June and was going to celebrate that accomplishment today. His hobbies, water sports, water polo. He, um, I've heard the story about him competing with his brother's water polo team when you were in high school and he was just about 10 years old. And uh, he got to be involved in some of those tournament teams. He also loved fishing, target shooting, video games, some of his favorite games, Call of Duty, Fortnite, and Madden. He enjoyed uh, gardening. That was a new one he had just started taking up. He enjoyed reading and playing cards. He enjoyed getting out of town, and what he did, his favorite place was the beach, Newport Beach, Avila Beach. His favorite trip was one not taken long ago to a place called Cabo San Lucas. Happened to stay at the same place where Shelly and I have a timeshare, at a place called the Rosé. I don't recommend going there during spring break unless you're under 22, okay? Uh, but the rest of the time, it is great fun. And also, one of his best memories going on a trip was flying first class to Seattle with, uh, with Papa Mike, and uh, he thought that was pretty cool. His uh, favorite food, the first answer I got was, you know, Donovan just liked to eat. Uh, but two of his favorites were chili verde and teppanyaki. Uh, favorite desserts, pumpkin pie. Cadence, I understand on one occasion the two of you ate an entire pie. You're going to get a chance to do that today, all right? Lots of whipped cream on it over there. He, uh, he also enjoyed uh, Reese's peanut butter cups, Oreo cookies, and Oreo ice cream. If he had a favorite restaurant, it would be Wasabi on Fire and Casa Corona. Not bad choices. If he was watching something on, uh, on TV, he enjoyed Survivor, the Marvel movies, and zombie programs. His favorite style of music was slow hip-hop, a little rap with Polo G and Suicide Boys, and again... It's a mystery to me, guys, all right, but um, I'm going to roll with it. Uh, he was a sports fan, uh, enjoyed the Golden State Warriors, the San Francisco 49ers, in fact, had an entire Christmas tree decorated, all right, of the 49ers, and then somehow he got screwed up. Uh, he went from a Bay Area fan to the L.A. Dodgers, and I'm not sure. Ah! Um. I just had to hire an, another pastor here at New Hope, and he wore a Dodger hat to the interview, and it almost cost him the job. <laughs> we were, uh, I was so blessed not only to have had the honor of being part of a most special day which started this family as Mike and Vince got married, but... Um, when I shared that news with my wife, she all of a sudden went to her phone and started looking for some pictures of the past. And she said, I remember him as a little boy in my Sunday school class. And uh, just right over there in that building. And then out here in the pavilion a few minutes ago with Taylor, I was telling her that we had a call after church on Sunday when I had shared a prayer request for the family. And another Sunday school teacher that we have here, we call him Teacher Eddie, called to see, is this the Donovan that I had in my class? And his sister was my helper. 
And so uh, you guys made an impact, all right, when you were here, and that was our privilege. When I ask the family to describe Donovan to me, just what word pops in your mind that describes his character and personality, they gave me a pretty colorful list, all right, of things that described him. And maybe as you hear their comments, it will jar a thought in your mind, and I'll let you just shout out right from where you're seated a thought that comes into your mind um, uh, about Donovan. But here's what the family had to say. He was witty. He was an old soul. He was a smart ass. <laughs> ass is mentioned in the Bible, okay? So it's okay, <laughs> all right? It was fun-loving. He was a sour patch kid. He was the best only child. <clears throat> there were times he didn't think he had a brother or sister, all right? It was just him and the world. Uh, but Donovan did really well all by himself. He had a huge heart for others. He was outgoing. He was fun-loving. He was caring. He checked on others. He had a charismatic personality. He was genuine. He was very introspective. Anything else pops in your mind that you can just shout out from where you are? Best bear hugs, all right, good. And he was a Buchanan bear, by the way, yeah. Cat's got your tongue. So think about this, and when we're over enjoying some food together, share those thoughts around the table. And um, in the next few months, there are going to be some firsts for this family, and those are going to be challenging, as you know. So do me a favor. Uh, it's okay to send a text. It's okay to send an email. They won't mind that. But that's so easy today. Why don't you put a little effort? And around Thanksgiving or Christmas or a birthday, actually go to a store and buy a card. Buy a Hallmark. Shows you care to give the very best. <laughs> and handwrite a note that says, man, just thinking about you and Donovan right now. And when I've shared this in the past, I've had people come up to me after and say, Tim, that's just going to make them cry. You know what? They're going to be crying anyway. And they would much rather shed some tears that are filled with a bit of joy because they know there are other people who are thinking about their son and their sibling at that very same time. Uh, he had some nicknames, too. I, I hope I got them all right. All right. Uh, Donnie, which his mother hated. All right. Dano. Uh, he had a coach that called him Grumpy Old Man. <laughs> well, those are a few thoughts from the family to share. Another perspective from Micah's cousin is Delia, or I think the family calls you something else. But Delia, come on up. Where are you? I lost, there you are. And Delia is going to be followed by, I believe it's your sister. Am I correct on that? Sandy is going to come and share some poetry with us. All right, so there you are. Kind, sweet, loving, and shy. These are so many more words. There are so many more words to describe Donovan. Whether we were playing games or going to the beach or looking at supercars, watching you play water polo, you were always smiling. And we always enjoyed our time together. I watched you grow from a sweet baby boy to a beautiful young man. And I am saddened that I'm gonna have to miss what was yet to be seen. Your life was cut too short. You were an amazing son, brother, uncle, nephew, and cousin. Your light and your love will be missed by so many families and friends. I am sorry that you were gone from us. It's been way too soon. I will always love you and miss your presence in this life. Rest in eternal peace, Donovan, until we see each other again. And may God bless you and wrap, him, wrap you in his loving arms. Sandy, come on up.
So we're, um, we're Micah's cousins, but we're more like sisters. So the day I went to heaven, you didn't get to say goodbye. But it's okay. You didn't need to. More time will come for you and I. You wonder if you'll ever see me in heaven's loving light someday. Oh, yes, please know we'll be together as if we'd never been away. Please know there is no pain in heaven. There is no sorrow and no fear. On days you feel these tough emotions, please know I'm at your side and I'm here. I know you feel I left you too soon, you say. Why did you have to go? I'm simply on my next life's chapter. I never left, and I love you so. So when the sun shines upon your face, please know that light's filled with my love. And in the darkness and the starlight, I'm watching you just from above. I'll always be there, right at your side, as you live life in your sweet style. There's no need for a goodbye. I'll simply see you in a while. We love you. Friends that are like family are the Rudes and the Bantas, and um, with the pictures provided by Vince and Micah, um, Shelley and her mom Diana put together a pictorial tribute in honor of Donovan today. So sit back, uh, watch, and enjoy as we celebrate Donovan's life with this pictorial tribute.
He was so dang photogenic. I hate him. Even and only wearing a slingshot, all right? He looked good, all right? Absolutely amazing. You know, the cousins came up here and each of their thoughts um, contained references to heaven. That's our hope when life here is over. And the challenge for us today is to understand that the God who wants to give us heaven when we die is the same God who wants to give us hope and strength while we live in this troubled world. And um, Bob Berthold's going to come back and sing another song that ties in with the remarks of both of you in a song called I Can Only Imagine. None of us have ever seen heaven. Uh, trust me, it is not blue skies, billowy clouds, and cherubim sitting on harps, all right? Sorry, playing harps. I don't know about you, but that sounds like hell to me. Um, the, the, the Bible says that heaven is beyond our wildest imagination. And so this song does its best to get us to imagine how incredible the future can be for us. Thanks, Bob. I 
I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. My grandparents and my parents all moved out here from Oklahoma, and we still have a lot of relatives that live there. So from the time I was an infant up until even this year, I've made the car driving trip from here to Oklahoma. I've been through the Mojave Desert probably over a hundred times going and coming. And I've noticed only one animal in the Mojave Desert, only one, you don't see much. And it's usually a vulture, and it's floating down above the highway. It's looking for roadkill. It's looking for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I didn't realize until I read an article uh, about a year and a half ago that there is another bird that thrives in the Mojave Desert. I've never seen it. The other bird that thrives in the Mojave Desert is a hummingbird. I thought all of them lived in my backyard. This time of year, they all seem to congregate there. Two very different birds. One very large, one very small, two very different appetites. One looks for the rotting flesh of dead animals. The other one seats the nectar of the blossoms of the cactus. And guess what? They both find what they're looking for. And the question for us today is, what are we looking for? Are we looking for more pain? Are we looking for more frustration? Are we looking for more reason to be sad and to do harm to ourselves? Or will Donovan's life have an impact on us and prompt us to look at things maybe a bit differently and begin to be more like a hummingbird and look for that which is fresh and alive, maybe turn even to the promises of God? I wished I had played water polo when I was in high school because I could relate better but I sink like a rock when I get in a swimming pool. I always have. I was involved in sports most of my teen years, from Little League to Cary Park baseball to football to track to wrestling. I peaked very early. In my days, we had seventh, eighth, and ninth grade as junior highs, and I peaked at the ninth grade. I hit five foot eight, and I got stuck. That year, I lettered in basketball, wrestling, and I was an MVP in track. Wrestling was the sport that I enjoyed the most, and it confuses a lot of people. It's a sport I believe that is one of the most difficult, takes a lot of physical endurance, only exceeded probably by water polo. I have an amazing appreciation for all of those who do that sport. But these sports reveal a lot about an individual, their heart, their will, their determination. Like water polo, wrestling is a sport of extreme discipline. It is all about leverage and technique. Uh, a world-famous wrestler one time said, once you've wrestled, everything else in life is easy. Uh, I think you might even be able to say that about water polo. It's a killing sport. The, the practices for wrestling were grueling. The physical demands were extreme. And I will admit, foolish, like losing weight at the last minute in order to compete in a certain class. However, unless you understand the sport of wrestling, it's kind of confusing. So let me give you about a one minute crash course and maybe in a few minutes all this will make sense. In, in wrestling, the purpose is to take your opponent down, to get them down to the ground from a standing position. If you do that, that's called a takedown and it's worth two points. If your opponent takes you down to the ground, you don't get anything unless you can do a reversal. Did you like that move? All right, yeah, it used to be faster. Um, <laughs> 
then you get two points for the reversal and you're no longer on the bottom of the pile, you're on the top of the pile. Then what you want to do is get the person on the bottom of the pile over on their back with some kind of manipulative move and get a near pin for three points or you actually want to win the match by pinning them. Now at Hoover High School, and I just had the privilege of being there a couple of months ago for a baseball event, and they let me go through the old wrestling room, and guess what I found? I found that it hadn't changed at all in over 40 years. I found the sign that I used to look at every day in the wrestling room was still in the crack of the ceiling. And the sign in those days and still today read this. If you can read this sign, you are pinned. I did my best not to read that sign very often, but I did on a few occasions. There are two other main scoring options in this event of wrestling. If a wrestler, after being taken down, gets away from his opponent, it's called an escape, and you get one point. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, if instead of an escape, you can do a reversal or a switch, you get two points. With that short and simple explanation of how wrestling is scored, I want to take some thoughts out of this sport which might help us learn some powerful truths to take away. Number one, everyone in life will suffer a takedown. I don't care how good a wrestler you were, you will be taken down at some time in your career. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there are a lot more scoring opportunities if we are offensively minded But what I learned in wrestling is that at some point, no matter how good you are, a takedown is inevitable. I don't care how strong or dominant you've been at life, at some point, at some time, someone will take you off your feet. Some of us who go to church walk around life like we're some kind of super Christians and nothing could ever faze us. We never let anybody see us cry. We play like we're tough. We live like we're tough. But I'm here to tell you, Everyone suffers a takedown, even pastors. We may as well take off our mask and our tough guy persona and own up to the fact that there are times in our life when the troubles of this world get an upper hand. Be a pastor whose wife moves 2,600 miles away and never wants to see him again. That's a takedown moment. We all get taken down. These moments hurt. They are embarrassing, and they are unsettling. And do you know what all of them require? Recovery, a reversal. I'll never forget the hardest takedown I ever experienced in the sport of wrestling. I was in a tournament where we wrestle four or five times a day if we're doing really good. If we only wrestle twice, it's been a bad day. It means we lost both of them. In my first match that day, I built up a 5-0 lead, and then somehow my opponent got behind me, picked me up, trapped my left arm against my side, and then threw me to the ground with all of his weight on top of me, and my left arm went completely numb. I couldn't feel it. I couldn't use it. He scored five quick points, tied the match, and somehow in the last, the last round of that match, I was able to get one point by escaping, and then I ran the rest of the match from that guy. It's called a stall. It turned out to be the best day of my wrestling career. I got the feeling in my arm back. I went four for five and took second in that tournament. That was my highest achievement. Some of you have endured brutal, painful takedowns in your life. Some of you have gone some things that have knocked you off your feet and knocked the wind out of you. You are dazed, bewildered, and the room is spinning. For some of you, it was a doctor's diagnosis that sent you to the mat with the C word. For some of you, it was the sound of a voice that for years had said, I love you. And now that very same voice says, I hate you. For some of you, it's been the domination of an addiction that has put you face down in the mat wondering, can I ever recover from this? However, what I want you to know is that if you've been taken down by life, a reverse is possible for you. And quite frankly, unless you've been taken down, you'll never experience the thrill of a reversal. The takedown doesn't have to be the last word in your life. The takedown doesn't have to be the final blow struck. You see, there are three options after you've been taken down to the mat. Number one, you could just quit. You can just say, I'm done. 
Throw in the towel, give up. I've seen that done before. I've seen it done in wrestling. I've seen somebody taken down very quickly, and then they just roll over on their back. One, two, three. Match is over. I'll be honest, my fastest pin that I had in on somebody was 12 seconds. That's because I took the guy down, he whispered in my ear, I hate wrestling. <laughs> it's the truth. And he just laid there. Wow, was I good that day. No, he was just that devastated with where he was in life. Sometimes there's an adversity or a pain that prompts us to cave in and to give up. We become a victim and we don't attempt to ever fight back. We toss in the towel. And today, today what I want to say to all of you is don't quit. Don't quit. We'll never advance in this thing called life if we roll over. The old statement that quitters never win is true in sports, and I believe it's true in faith as well. Matthew 24, 13 says, those that endure to the end will be saved. The message translation of the Bible says, stay with it. That's what God wants. He'll come to your rescue if you stay with it. In other words, don't quit. The other thing we can do when we've been taken down, which I think is far more productive than quitting, is we can escape. It's a lot better than quitting. You could try to get up and look for a way to get away from the problems that are holding you down. One of the greatest promises in the Bible is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where Paul says, There has no temptation come upon any of us, but what God is not faithful to provide us what we need to overcome the temptation that we are facing. For with every temptation comes, are you ready for this? A way of escape. There is a way to get up and get away. God never fails to provide, but we have to look towards him. I'll never forget Coach Kirkhart at Hoover High School. He told all of us as his wrestlers, he said, if you ever find yourselves on your back, look at me. Don't read the sign. Look at me. And he would show us what to do. And God says something even better. God says, when you feel like you've been taken down and you're about finished, look at me because I know how to raise the dead. I know how to lift you up. Look at me. Escape is great, but I want to remind you of something. It's only worth one point. Escaping the conflict doesn't conquer the problem. So what's our third option after we've been taken down? It's what we call a reverse. That's where instead of being on the bottom, we have used some move. For us, it was a, my favorite one was the switch. You reach around behind the guy, you grab him on the inside of his thigh. As hard as you can, you push around and you end up on top. Just like that, it can happen. And God says, in the temptations of your life and the takedowns of your life, I want you to know I'll provide for you, if you'll look at me, a reversal of your circumstances. I want to state loud and proud that I'm grateful for ways of escape, but I'm also glad there's a third option, that I can get two points with a reversal. Could it be that if I just stayed in this relationship one moment longer, it would turn out right? Could it be that if I could just endure the misery one week longer, we might find recovery? Could it be that if I were disciplined enough in my work one more month, I would get that raise that I needed? Could it be that God's trying to set me up for a reverse that would lead to victory with the challenges I'm facing right now? Perhaps your determination to escape is causing you to lose opportunities to score a reversal. Maybe, probably, God has wanted to give you the upper hand in this fight you're going through, but you're too busy reading the sign on the ceiling. Maybe you are this close to dominating what has been dominating you, but you escape and you run instead of have a reversal. I've come to tell somebody, specifically Mike and Vince, Taylor, Gio, the rest of the family, that God wants to turn things around from this day on for you. He wants to turn the table on this moment. Don't escape when a reversal is in God's plans for you. I am glad that we can get away. Do you remember, I talked about Samson earlier. Do you guys remember a character by the name of Joseph in the Bible? Maybe you've seen a play about him called The Coat of Many Colors. Okay, Joseph was a guy who, um, he was handsome, he was personable. Everybody loved him except his brothers. They were all jealous of him. 
So one day the brothers got a crazy idea. You know what? Let's kill him. Finally, the oldest brother said, you know, that might be a little extreme. Let's just tell dad we, that he died and throw him in a pit. And then they said, oh, that's too, too extreme. So they sold him. And he was carted off to a far country. He ended up in prison. And then he ended up interpreting a dream. And then he ended up being the second most powerful person in the world at that time in Egypt. And he helped the Pharaoh of Egypt overcome a drought and... Um, uh, he helped them survive seven years because they were ready for the drought. And then it was his brothers and his dad who came to Egypt because they were hungry and starving in the, in the drought. And guess who they had to ask for food? The brother they thought was dead. They didn't recognize him at first. And then he revealed himself to them. And did he try to get vengeance on them? No. He looked at them and said, brothers, what you intended for evil, what you intended to pin me down in life for your own advantage, God has not wasted. What you intended for evil, God used for good, and I can save your life today. Jesus says to all of us who are here today, do you feel like you've been taken down and you're on the mat and you're about ready to, to be pinned? Is there some kind of relationship or end that is struggling and you seem like you can't get out of it? Is there a drug addiction that is crushing you? Is there an attitude that is defeating you? Is there a sorrow that you need turned into joy? Remember, God knows how to turn crucifixions into resurrections. And he could do that for you today. Don't just look for a way of escape. Look for a reversal. Look for God to do something with your pain today that will make the difference for all of your eternity. I'm going to ask all of you to do something I wouldn't normally do in a service like this, but I'm going to do it today. Are you tired of being beaten up by life? Are you tired of being frustrated by how ugly our world is? If you are, then that means all of us need a reversal. So I'm going to count to three, and I want all of you to say out loud, I need a reversal! Can you do that with me today? All right, one, two, three. I need a reversal. We need one. Just like the blind man that Jesus healed and he said, once I was blind, but now I can see. Just like the woman at the well that Jesus ministered to. In case y'all don't know that story, Jesus went alone to a well in the middle of a day and nobody's supposed to be there. And guess what he found? He found a hooker. Yeah, you know the story, huh? The reason she was out there in the middle of the day is she was ashamed to go with everybody else from town in the evening. And when Jesus sees her coming, he doesn't treat her like most men did. He said, I'd like to give you some water where you'll never thirst again. And do you know what that lady does? She has a conversation with Jesus. He tells her everything she's done in the past, tells her all the crappy life that she's lived. And he says, but my father loves you and I'll offer you everlasting life. She ran back to town to those people that she had tried to avoid. She said, guys, come out to the well and meet a man who told me everything I'd ever done and yet he still loved me. And a revival broke out in town because of a hooker in Jesus at a well. God can take the worst moments of your life and turn them around. How about two thieves on a cross on crucifixion day? Do you remember that? When Jesus was crucified, there was a thief on his right and a thief on his left. And the one on the right said, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, get us down from here. Still very selfish, still wanting what he wanted. The thief on the other side yelled over there and said, hey, shut up. You and I are getting what we deserve. And then he turned to Jesus and he said, you don't deserve to be here, but I do. And then are you ready for his prayer? His prayer was this, will you remember me? when you come into your kingdom. Not very fancy, is it? Wasn't long, was it? What did Jesus say to him? Go do 12 Hail Marys first and then maybe I'll let you in. Go to church six weeks in a row and maybe you'll be good enough. Did he say write a big check and maybe you can buy your way in? Jesus said today, you'll be with me. I don't recommend you try to cut it that close. But... <laughs> But that's how much God loves us. 
He loves us to our very last breath. His grace pursues us to the very last moment. I know Donovan knew of the grace of God because I know who his Sunday school teachers were when he was little. I wished some of those stories would have permeated to influence some of the decisions that he made. But you see, our good decisions don't get us into heaven and our poor decisions don't take us out of heaven. It is our faith in who Jesus was and the grace, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense the goodness of a loving God to my sinfulness. God wants to give us a reversal. A thief found it at the last moment of his life. If we could receive a letter from God on the subjects of problems in life, it might read like this. Good afternoon. I'm God. Today I'll be handling all of your problems. Remember, I don't need your help with your problems. If the devil happens to deliver a situation to you that you cannot handle and it puts you on the mat, do not attempt to resolve it. Kindly put it in the F SFJTD file. That means something for Jesus to do. It'll be addressed in my time, not yours. Once the matter is placed into the box, do not hold on to it or attempt to remove it. Holding on or removing will delay, delay the resolution of your problem. If it is a situation that you think of you are capable of handling, please consult me in prayer to be sure that that is the proper assumption. It is not. Because I do not sleep and I do not slumber, there is no need for you to lose any sleep. Rest, my child. If you need me, contact me. I'm a whisper away. You see, God is the hope for us when we're hopeless, and God is the help for us when we are helpless. He is the love for us when we feel so unlovely, and he is the strength for us when we are absolutely weak. He is the rest when we are trying too hard. He is our peace when we are crying too long, and he is he our comfort as we go through this process of dying. What do you need today? Do you need a reversal of your eternal destiny? Do you need to walk away from here today and know that if my death came unexpectedly at any age, that I know that heaven will be my home? Which thief do you want to follow? Then there's a simple prayer. I'm not going to make any of you pray, but I'm going to invite you to pray. Just bow your heads, everybody, right now for a moment. Whether you're praying or not, dream about something else. But if you'd like to pray a prayer, say something like this in your own heart. Dear God, I need a reversal in my life. I know, I know that I haven't had a relationship with you before. I am flat on my back and I'm tired of being the God of my own life. And I ask for your forgiveness. I've heard the story of Jesus at Christmas and I've heard the story of Jesus at Easter. And I believe that he is your son. I believe that he died for all of my sin and I believe that you raised him from the dead to life and I want to trust him right now as my savior. I want a reversal from where I am in life. Guide my life and help me to be all you want me to be and I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I prayed that prayer or one very similar to that when I was five years old at Hume Lake Christian Camp. And trust me, it saved me from making a lot of bad choices. I wish I could tell you it saved me from making every bad choice, but it saved me from a lot. Many of you are here today and you already know Christ, but you're about to read the sign on the ceiling of the wrestling room. You're pinned. You need a reversal. You need to move from fear to faith, from panic to peace, from selfishness to selflessness, from weakness to strength. The Apostle Paul is the greatest example of how to get a reversal in life that I've known in all the scriptures. And he wrote this, if we have God's treasure in this earthen vessel, this life, that the excellence of the power of God lives in us and not us ourselves. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We have been struck down, but we have not been destroyed. Why? Because the life of the Lord Jesus lives in me. Let me wrap this up. Are some of you ready for a do-over before you're done over? Do you need a reversal before you're penned? It will start with a, a change in your spiritual direction. 
the acknowledgement of a prayer like we just prayed, I have a need for God because I can't handle life on my own. It continues with a change of social direction. This is the hard part, folks. We are influenced by our peers. And sometimes if there's going to be a change in our lives, it's not just a spiritual direction, but it's a social direction. You may need to say, I don't need intoxication or drug-induced influences anymore in my life to have a good time or to solve my problems. It's time for there to be no more DUIs or LUIs. And if you don't know what LUI is, it's living under the influence. It's time to live under the influence of God's grace. And when there's a change in spiritual direction and a change in social direction, there's a change for society's direction. Friends, family, school districts, community leaders, pastors, Sunday school teachers, we've got to get the, our heads out of the sand. And forgive me, we may need to get our heads out of our butts and face the fact we have a cultural problem. We need to be the kind of friends who say to another friend, let's go get help together. We need to be the kind of families that say, let's do this together. We need to be the kind of church that says, I may be taken down, but I want your help to get me up. Some of us need to get our minds right and quit thinking about quitting and stop running. And we need to get a reversal in life. It's time to beat up what's been beating us up. We need a reversal. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I love you. And I have to acknowledge that there are times, even as a pastor, I struggle with trusting you. But when I look back over my life, I know that you have been the overcomer again and again and again. I believe that you have provided for me, as your scripture says, you have provided for me everything I need to live life now and enjoy godliness. Today I confess my human frailty and my own weakness of faith, but I desire your will to be functional in my life. And I am so grateful that you had Isaiah write several thousands of years ago these words that are as real today as they were when they were penned by Isaiah. Even young people get tired and weary, stumble and fall, but those whose hope in the Lord, you will renew their strength. You will enable us to soar on the wings like eagles and you will enable us to run and not grow weary and we will be able to walk through this life and not faint. And Lord, I pray for that kind of strength for the Dementi family today, for the friends of Donovan's who gathered here. I pray that there are young people and family members and close friends who will recognize a need that Christ can meet today and give them a strength to soar above their problems, to get them up off the mat and experience victory in their life. Thank you, Father, that you are the God of all comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me give some direction before we dismiss you. One thing that um, the family wanted me to share with all of you is uh, there's going to be a scholarship fund that is going to start that's going to be in Donovan's name. Um, Micah, where will they go to to find when that's posted? On your Facebook page? Say, so keep an eye open for Micah's Facebook page. And uh, very soon she will have posted what the scholarship is for, how it will be used, and you can be a participant in Donovan's life, continuing to have an impact on the lives of others. So please pay attention to that. Uh, the staff of Farewell is here. Bob has been singing and now he's going to fulfill his other duties. He's going to escort the family out. So those of you who are family on these first two rows on either side, if you would stand please, you're gonna follow Bob out those side doors and then your, the rest of your family and friends will be following you in just a moment. As they are doing that, let me give a few other directions. Ladies room on my left, men's room on my right here.